sitting here at the Bodhi tree. Just want to get it to look. I don't know. How about like maybe so? I think that's probably fine. And so we are going to continue the reading of the Sekka Panha. And last time we just ended off. Uh, on the topic between some of the uh, differences between the Mahayana and the Theravada tradition and some of the sects that has uh, kind of divided up the different traditions and make sure you check out that previous episode what would I think that was part five and we're gonna be uh, ending off today with part six I think and we're going to be going through the ultimate goal and from that to moral practice of a candidate for Saka's office and then we're going to uh, finish off uh, with the elation of Saka. And so here we go. The ultimate goal. The ultimate goal. Sakka was pleased with the Buddha's answer and he asked another question. Lord, do the so-called Sammana Brahmanas really attain their ultimate goal? Is there a real end to their yoga, to their practice? Do they live the really noble life? Do they really have the ultimate Dhamma? Here, the really ultimate goal, the real end to yoga, Ichanta Yoga Kikami, and the, uh, and the really ultimate Dhamma, Ichanta Pariyosana, refer to Nibbana. The noble life means the practice of vipassana and the Aryan path. In other words, by these four questions, Saka asks the Buddha, the Buddha, whether the ascetics and the brahmanas practice vipassana and the eightfold path, and whether they have attained nibbana. Here, the bhikkhus refer to in the Buddha's statement are oh I'm sorry I skipped a line let me just start here uh, the Buddha answered in the negative and so uh, Saka just asked if they had really attained the ultimate goal uh, Saka asked the Buddha whether the ascetics and the brahmanas practice uh, vipassana and the Eightfold Path and whether they have attained Nibbana. The Buddha answered in the negative. According to the Buddha, only the bhikkhus who are liberated through the practice on the path leading to the extinction of craving achieve the supreme goal, put an end to yoga, lead the noble life and attain the ultimate Dhamma. Here, 
The bhikkhus referred to in the Buddha's statement are the Buddhas, Pacheka Buddhas, private Buddhas, uh, solitary Buddhas, and Arahants. In short, they are all Arahants. The Arahant has done away with the four yogas, asavas, biases, that give rise to new existence. In fact, he has uprooted the yogas and so he has attained the ultimate goal and the ultimate dhamma, and his final victory is due to his practice of the Eightfold Noble Path. Those who have not yet been those who have not yet freed themselves from the yogas or biases through the Eightfold Path are far from Nibbana. They continue to be subjected to, to rebirth and suffering. So when Bhakka Brahma invited the Buddha to what he regarded as his eternal paradise, the Buddha told him to have no illusion about his mortality and to have no craving for any kind of existence. Says the Buddha, having seen the perils of all kinds of existence, whether it be that of a human being, a Deva, a Brahma, or the denizens of the lower worlds, I do not glorify any kind of existence, but deprecate it. And if you want to learn more about the Brahma invitation from Bhakka Brahma to the Buddha, where they kind of get to play hide and seek, or, or <laughs> uh, this Brahma challenges the Buddha to find him three times, and then the Buddha finds him all three times, and then the Buddha hides once, and the Brahma searches the entire universe and all the world systems everywhere, but he, he, I mean, I mean, and all the realms, and the, he just can't find the Buddha. And so he ret returns to his um, Brahma realm where he rules, and uh, he proclaims to his followers, I mean, in his uh, godly abode, he he has to admit that he couldn't find the Buddha and so it's an interesting story if you want to read more about it it is uh, I've got a, I've got it on my YouTube channel and it is called the Brahma invitation okay continuing on with this text every kind of existence is subject to suffering it is worst in the lower worlds but human existence is also bedeviled by old age, sickness, and death. And the Devas, too, have to suffer because of their frustrated desires. Nor is the Brahma, nor is the Brahma world free from dukkha, attendant on thinking, planning, and ceaseless change. I have seen the perils of every kind of existence. I have also seen the existence of those who do not want it and who therefore seeks its extinction. So I deprecate all kinds of, ex of existence. Being aware of all the evils of existence, some wise men became ascetics to seek liberation, but they did not know Nibbana, or the Eightfold Path leading to it. They knew only Jhana, that made one's mind tranquil, and so they practiced Samadhi, concentration, that led to it Jhana. Some attained Rupa Jhana, and believed that they would enjoy immortality in Rupa Vachara Brahma world. The goal of such jhana, uh, the goal of such jhana, 
For some ascetics, eternal life was to be found in asanya, perceptionless uh, abode of the rupa vachara, the Brahma world, while for others it was to be enjoyed only in the arupa vachara world. So they were content with the rupa jhana and the arupa jhana that they had attained. Contrary to their expectations, these jhanic uh, these yogis were not immortal in the Brahma worlds, and so after death they returned to the sensual worlds of devas and human beings. From there they passed on according to their karma. As a result of their evil karma, they might find themselves in the lower worlds. Thus, although they had uh, sought the extinction of existence, they did not achieve their object and had to go on suffering. Hence, the Buddha's dis Disdain, dis, the, the Buddha's disdain for all kinds of existence. The renewal of existence is due to attachment to life. This attachment, tanha, is the same as sensual bias, kama yoga, and the bias for existence, bhava yoga. The Buddha repudiated and overcame his uh, this attachment. According to the commentary, there were altogether fourteen questions which Saka put to the Buddha. He was much pleased with the answers and after expressing his deep appreciation, he stated his view about tanha, attachment, as follows. Lord, the active tanha is a disease. It is like a boil, an arrow, or a thorn in the flesh. It attracts living beings to existence, and so they have to live miserably. Tanha is active because it craves for this and that. It, at, it attaches itself to pleasant objects, and it longs to consume them. Like a leaf rustling in the wind, it is always in a furry, in a flurry, restless, hungry, and greedy state. Tanha is a chronic disease that is not curable, but not so acute as to cause immediate death. It sets a man at ease when it is gratified, but it is insatiable however much he pampers it with the sense objects which he likes. It craves for all sense objects which it seeks to enjoy again and again. Tanha is loathsome and terrible like a boil. It is also like a thorn in the flesh. A thorn may be hidden in the flesh so that we cannot see it, see any sign of it. We cannot e extricate it, and so it will keep on causing pain. Likewise, it is hard to get rid of tanha that is always harassing us. We, we worry so much about the object of our desire that we cannot sleep at night. And because of our attachment to life, we have to wander from one existence to another, the nature of each existence depending on our karma. After thus commenting on the Buddha's teaching, Saka said that he, he was now free from all doubts as a result of hearing the Buddha's discourse. He had attained the first stage of the holy path, and this, of course, ruled out the possibility of his landing in the lower worlds after death. He was assured 
of a good rebirth and he could now attain the higher stages of insight independently. And so Saka had attained to the Suttapana stage, the first stage of enlightenment, from which there are four. There is Suttapana, and then there is a Suttapana has a maximum of seven lives left in samsara. And then there is a Sakirigami, which is a once returner. And then there is an Anagami, this is a non returner. And then there is the Arahat, a fully enlightened being. So with that, we have finished the chapter on the ultimate goal, which is neither the Deva realms or the Brahma realms or any of the lower realms for that matter. Now we are going to we are continuing on with learning about how to practice such a moral code so as to be a candidate for Saka's office. But I think we're gonna have to oh oops I think we're gonna have to wait a little bit because uh, as we read the last time Saka was pretty pleased that he's gonna be Saka for thirty six million years. And if that's thirty six million years in the heavens of the 33 where Saka rules and that's a real long time here on earth but anyway the moral practice of a candidate for Saka's office the commentary mentions the seven duties of a man who aspires to be Saka the Okay, I think my mic just cut out. Um, yeah, can, okay, so. <laughs> I was just wondering if the sound was okay before, but I think it was. I'm going to continue on now. I think my headset just popped off. Um, the moral practice of a candidate for Saka's office. The commentary mentions the seven duties of a man who aspires to be Saka. These are spelled out in the Sakata Waka Samyutta as follows. One. He supports and looks after his parents during his whole life. 2. He always reveres old people among his relatives. 3. He speaks gently and sweetly. 4. He never speaks ill of another person. 5. He manages to keep and keeps his household with his mind always free from the taint of miserliness. 6. He always, he always speaks the truth. 7. He sees, he sees to it that he is never angry. If he sometimes gets angry, he removes his anger instantly. As for Sakka, who had the dialogue with the Buddha, in the Sakkapanha Sutta, the commentary on the Sutta gives an account of his previous life as the youth, youth Maka in uh, Makala village in the kingdom of Maka 
in the, in the kingdom of Magadha long before the rise of Buddhism. Magga was the leader of 33 young men who had prepared roads or, and bridges, built rest houses and did other good deeds collectively for the welfare of the community. The headman of the village heeded these social workers Oh, I'm sorry. The headman of the village hated these social workers because he was corrupt and formally he used to get money from, from them when they were given to drinking and doing unlawful things. But now that they were devoting themselves entirely to social service, there was an end to his illegal source of income. So he went to the king and made false charges against the young men, without making any inquiry. The king ordered them to be arrested and trampled to death by elephants. Then Maka said to his friends, It is but natural that misfortunes befall all beings who are minded in the round of samsaric existence. The real refuge <coughs> I'm sorry. The real refuge of the people in this world is speaking the truth. So, so you all should say solemnly, if we are thieves or robbers, let that elephant trample us. If we are not, let it not trample us. And Maga's friends acted on his advice. Then the elephant did not even approach near them, but ran away trumpeting loudly. They harassed and goaded the animal with spears, etc. But it was in vain, so the young men were brought before the king. Questioned by the king, Maga said that it was their invocation of uh, the power of truth, Satya that had repel had helped to repel the elephant he also told the king that they were do what he also told the king what they were doing before and how it was oh okay what they were doing before and how it was greed that had prompted the village headman to frame false charges against them on hearing this, the king at once set them free and conferred on them gifts and permanent ownership of Makkala village. The young men devoted themselves to community service more zealously and vigorously than ever, and on their death Makka became Saka, and his thirty-three comrades became Dewas in his celestial abode. Such in brief is the account of Maka's good deeds that led his rebirth as Saka. There is one thing that we should note in the story of Maka. The performance of good deeds was not due to their thorough knowledge of the Buddha Dhamma. Perhaps they might have heard only that good deeds bear good f uh, fruits, and it was this simple teaching that motivated Maka to do good deeds. He became the king of the Devas, and after hearing the Buddha's discourse as Saka, he attained the first stage on the holy path. This shows that a person may not have Makapala and Nibbana in mind while he is doing good deeds. But if he believes in the law of karma and performs good deeds sincerely, he will, as a result, pass on to the deva or human world to be reborn there with wholesome predispositions. Tihetu Patisantika Being reborn with three noble root conditions, with lack of greed, lack of hatred and lack 
of ignorance. poisons. Okay, so thanks to such uh, predispositions, he can attain special insights after hearing and practicing the Dhamma. So, when we do good deeds, our actions should be based on the belief in karma. The best thing, of course, is to do good in the hope of attaining the path of Nibbana. So that's like if you want to believe believe in anything, believe in your own good deeds, not performed out of fearing blame or fearing hell or like fearing God or fearing Sakka. No, but based off the belief in karma, that if one does a good deed, then there will be a good result. And if one does a bad deed of body, speech, and mind, or thoughts, there will be a bad result. Simply put. And now, to finish off this wonderful text, or talk, abbreviation of the text, um, we're going to be reading on with the elation of Sakka. And this is going to be the last passage in the text. And so, here we go. The elation of Sakka. When Sakka expressed his joy for the attainment of the first stage on the holy path, the Buddha asked him whether he had ever experienced such joy before. Sakka replied thus, Lord, I was once overjoyed when I came out victorious in my fight against the Asuras. But that joy over victory had its origin in the clash of weapons. It had nothing to do with dissolution. It did not lead to special insight and knowledge or nibbana. But now my joy over the attainment of suttapana stage is not rooted in the clash of weapons. It is bound up with, the, with dissolution and detachment. It will also lead to illumination and detachment and nibbana. Saka went on to say that he was overjoyed in the view of six benefits that would accrue him, accrue to him, occur to him. One, the first thing that had made him joyful was his attainment of Suttapana stage and the renewal. Uh, of existence as Saka, for his good deeds in his previous life as Magga, he first became the king of Devas. His first existence lasted 36 million years by human reckoning. So there you have it. Then, seeing that his death was imminent, he came to hear the Buddha Dhamma. While hearing the Buddha's talk, on wholesome upeka, he practiced vipassana and attained the first stage on the holy path. He was overjoyed because of his permanent liberation from the lower worlds and the prospect of enjoying the heavenly bliss for another 36 million years in heaven. Number two. He will be reborn in the human family of his own choice when his life in the Deva world has run its course. It is said 
that the span of life among human beings is now decreasing by one year in every century. 2,500 years have elapsed since the time of the Buddha, and so we have to assume that the lifespan of human life has fallen off by 25 years. This assumption is plausible, is plausible since today only few people live up to 75 years. Man's lifespan is likely to be reduced to 10 years in the next 6,500 years. It is said that by that time the delicacies in the human world such as butter, honey, etc. will have disappeared. Good varieties of rice will become a thing of the past and poor quality grain will become the best stable food. People will no longer avoid killing, stealing and other misdeeds. Immoral acts will become rampant and nobody will have any sense of moral values. Those who do not respect their parents, elderly relatives or virtuous monks will be extolled and honored by many people. Even now there is a trend towards such disregard of traditional values in some places. Moreover, there will be sexual perversions such as incest and the moral life of mankind will degenerate to the level of animals. Talking about the food before, I mean, Saka is worried about butter and honey and the varieties of food. I mean, at this point, people will be eating humans. They will be cannibals. <laughs> Saka. You gotta remember that Saka is not fully enlightened. But yeah, he's deluded if he thinks that the worst thing about this is the food. It probably is the worst thing, knowing but it will be cannibalism. Anyway, people will become extremely malicious, aggressive, and murderous, and so will the parents and children in their relationship. Fran Frantricidal strife will mark the interpersonal relations among brothers and, si and sisters, there will occur armed conflicts followed by a holocaust that will lead to mutual destruction, with men mistaking one another for animals. It will then be easy to produce powerful weapons. trying to charge my headset here. Is it off again? Hello, hello. It's popping on and off. <laughs> okay. So let's see here. The mic should sound should be on again. Um Okay, so it will be it will then be easy to produce powerful weapons. The possibility of such holocaust does not seem remote in view of the production of extraordinary weapons in modern times. Mutual destruction will eventually bring mankind to the verge of total extinction. Only those who do not want to kill or to be killed 
and take refuge in forests will escape death. It will not be easy for these few survivors to meet one another. They will meet only after traveling a long way, and as a result there will be mutual love and abstention from killing one another and other evil deeds. This will lead to gradual increase in the span of life. People will again do good, avoid evil and enjoy long life. A Saka's rebirth in the human world will take place in that age of progress they will have to he will have to associate with good people. Saka says that he will be conceived in his mother's womb without confusion. This shows what naturally happens to a Suttapana in his passage from one existence to another. Obviously, a Dewa's mind is clear and serene at the moment of death because he dies without suffering. Likewise, he will not be confused when he is in the womb of his, mo of his human mother. The human, uh, the human Suttapana too dies without confusion. He may be afflicted with physical pain, but his consciousness is clear and normal. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it is at this time we cannot say that a Suttapana's mind state is normal I mean that's far from normal uh, depending on where in the world you are so although he is unable to speak he uh, usually dies with his mind free from uh, confusion and obscurity. Sakka is happy because he will die peacefully and pass on to the human world to be reborn in the noble family of his one choice. Um, and number three. Sakka says that it will give him much pleasure uh, to live by the teachings of the Buddha. If the span of human life is to decrease by one year in every century, it will be reduced to ten years at the uh, end time, or at the end of ninety centuries. Suppose a great part of the human race were to be wiped out by a nuclear war. Saka would be only. Uh, Okay, so what does it say? Saka would be only 90, 100 years old, and he would live and more than another. Ninety hundred years. Oh, okay. So suppose a great part of the human race were to be wiped out by a nuclear war, Saka would be only oh, like uh, <laughs> 900 years old. 90 hundred? That's like one. 90. Okay, anyway. And he would live for more than 35 million years. The years of the average man's life would then run into hundreds of thousands. In the view of the prediction about the 5,000 year existence of the Buddha's teaching and mass, destru mass destruction by global conflict in the age of man's 10 year lifespan, it is to be assumed that Buddhism will become extinct by that time. There will be nobody who has memorized the Buddha Dhamma, nor will there be Buddhist books and scriptures. 
Inscriptions from the Pitaka may still exist in Myanmar, but there will be no one who can preach the Dhamma. But since Saka is a Suttapana, the Dhamma will remain fresh in his memory, as in the case of all other Aryas. Therefore, although Buddhism will be unknown to the majority of people at that time, it will continue to be a living force in the life of the man who is Saka incarnate. He will observe the five precepts, understand Anicca, Dukkha and Anatta on the Suttapana level and overcome some defilements. In other words, he will continue to be a dedicated disciple of the Buddha. A Suttapana in the immaterial Arupa would uh, Okay, so would would will a suttapana in the immaterial arupa will not forget to practice mindfulness. He can contemplate the mental process and attain arahantship. He may be in the rupa vachara brahma world uh, during the lifetime of the next Buddha, but as the disciple of the former Buddha, he will become an Arahant and attain Nibbana. These Suttapanas do not practice Vipassana as disciples of the succeeding Buddha. This is evident in the Suttavasa realm where some former disciples of the preceding six Buddhas identified themselves during the visit of Gautama Buddha. So. It is pointless to pray for arhantship under the guidance of another Buddha if one has already attained the Suttapana state on the basis of the former Buddha's teaching. Saka. Uh, oh, okay. So this basically means that if you become a Suttapana under, say, Kassapa Buddha, the Buddha before our present Buddha, uh, Buddha Gautama, then you will not be entering the Buddha Gautama's um, stream, so to say. You will not be a stream enterer in the, or you will not be an Anagami in the Buddha Gautama's Dhamma. You will continue to be in the lineage of Kasapa Buddha, just in case any Brahma or Dewa is listening right now. <laughs> because I don't think any one of us, maybe some of us, have come down from heaven. And I guess that could be that uh, they come from the lineage of the Kasapa Buddha or any other Buddha. Okay, so continuing on, Saka also says that while Saka also says that while living by the Buddha Dhamma, he will forever be mindful. He will continue to practice mindfulness just as he is practicing now. This prospect affords him with much pleasure because thereby he is assured of successive attainment of other insights. Saka, oh, and number four, Saka says, Lord, if through the right practice of Vipassana I attain Sambodhi, I will try and contemplate to attain higher insights. That somebody which I attain as a human being will mark the last of my human existence. Here somebody means the three higher stages of insight. But he says 
later that he will again become the king of Dewas, that after attaining Anagami stage in his present life, he will pass on to Suttawasa realm, and that he will, and that he will finally attain arahantship in Akanita realm. Uh, in view of these statements, the commentary holds that Sambodhi refers to Sakadagami insight, a non-returner. once return right so Saka will be a Sakadaga at Sakadagami stage when he passes on to the human world yeah so you have to be, be uh, Sakadagami you can't be an Anagami because then you cannot or you don't have to be a Sakadagami but Saka has to not go beyond the Sakadagami stage in order to pass on to the human world because an anagami does not return as a non-returner and continuing here it will be his last existence to be bound up with old age sickness and other sufferings of human life this is the fourth reason why he is joyful and five Saka says that after his death in the human world, he will again become a great Deva, Uttamo Deva, in the Deva worlds. According to the commentary, he will become the chief Deva in Tawatimsa heaven. So, if he has to pass through a single lifetime as a human being, the human lifespan must be the same as that of the Deva in Tawatimsa. In other words, Saka incarnate on Saka incarnate on earth must be as old as Saka who holds the office of Dewa chief. That is, he must live for uh, 36 million years. Alternately, alternatively, the Suttapana Saka may pass through several lifetimes. In that case, what are what are we in that case, what are we to understand by the seven lifetimes of a Suttapana? So again a Suttapana has seven lifetimes. Sakadagami is a run once returner. An Anagami does not return and an Arahant is a fully enlightened being as a human even, or I mean as a, a human or any realm from, from where they attained Arahantship. Here Saka's rebirths in the human world should be understood in the same sense as that of, of an Anagami person is said to be subjected to a single birth. So as Anagami Oh, okay, so an anagami is subject to a single rebirth. Maybe if he's a human, then he becomes a, uh, an anagami um, in the Brahma realms or in the immaterial realms, of course, because he's not an arahant, so he has to take birth as uh, like kind of a god, one of the real ones. Anyway, he may be reborn up to five times in Suttawasa realm, but since this takes place only in the material world and has nothing to do with the sensual or immaterial Arupa worlds, we may say that he is reborn only once. Likewise, Sakka may have many rebirths in terms of conceptions in the human world, 
but as his rebirth is restricted to human existence, it may be regarded as a single lifetime on earth. Sakka was overjoyed over the prospect of attaining Sakkaragami stage as a human being and rebirth as the chief of Devas. Sakka says, Akanimit, Akanita, Akanita world is so called because there are Devas who are endowed with power, wealth, longevity, and so forth. They are the noblest Dewas. I will have my last existence in that super world. Akanita is the highest of the five Suttawasa worlds. Although its inhabitants are called Devas, they are in fact Brahmas. Presumably, there are many Brahmas since each Brahma is said to have many attendant attendants. Sakka will be Sakkadagami on earth, Anagami in the Deva world, and he will pass on to Aviha which is the lowest of the Sudawasa worlds. Then, after passing through other celestial worlds, he will get to Akanita world, where he will attain Nibbana. According to the commentary, Saka will be in the Brahma worlds for 31,000 kappas. There are only two other persons, viz. Anatapindika, the merchant, and Visakka, the great woman disciple of the Buddha, who will enjoy the same longevity in the Brahma worlds. Thus, Sakka, Anatapindika, and Visakka have no peer in the respect of their high quality of life among beings subject to samsaric existence. So, the sixth cause of Sakka's joy was the prospect of attaining Nibbana in Akanita, Brahma world. Then, Sakka concluded his statement to the Buddha as follows, Lord, Today I pay respect to you, just as the Devas are doing so to Brahma. Lord, you are the only true Buddha, Sambuddha. You are the real teacher who can instruct the Devas and human beings for their welfare in other worlds of Brahmas in the worlds of Brahmas, Devas, and human beings, you have no peer. Then Saka uttered thrice, Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Dattiyampi for a third time Namo Dasa Bhakavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Glory be to the Buddha But it really means homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, and the Rightly Self-Awakened One. 
and for a second time homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, and the perfectly self-enlightened one, and for a third time homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, and the rightly self-awakened one, and made obedience to the Buddha joyfully. Here Arahato means worthy of honor, and Samma Sambuddha means one who knows the Four Noble Truths independently. This is the end of Sakapanha Sutta. The Sutta has enlightened many living beings, as it did to Sakka and many other Devas, and those who study and apply its teaching will certainly attain unusual inside knowledge on the Aryan Noble Path.